All right, introducing Steve Fogel. Our esteemed author and guest today is Steve Vogel, the author of Through the Perilous Fight, Six Weeks That Saved the Nation, and he also wrote a book called The Pentagon. He has written extensively about military affairs and the treatment of veterans from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. His reporting about the war in Afghanistan was part of a package of Washington Post stories selected as a finalist for the 2002 Pulitzer Prize. He covered the, the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack on the Pentagon and the building of subsequent reconstruction. He also covered the first Gulf War as well as the war in Iraq, in addition to the U.S. military operations in the Balkans, Rwanda, and Somalia. Please welcome Steve Vogel. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're going to make this more, instead of a lecture, we're going to make this more of a conversation about Steve's book. So first off, you might have noticed the subtitle is, is uh, Six Weeks That Saved the Nation. So I wanted to ask Steve, how did the six weeks here save the nation? Uh, it's a good question. And you have to, to, uh, to start with, you have to imagine the scene that uh, President James Madison confronted on the morning of August 26, 1814, uh, when uh, he comes back to Washington. And uh, you have every federal building, save one, has been destroyed. The, you know, the great landmarks of this country, the Capitol, the White House, uh, and uh, with it, the Supreme Court Library of Congress, they've, they've been gutted. Uh, you have an American army that has been uh, vanquished, is on the run. You have a British force that has just left the capital uh, by land, but then you have a second uh, British force that is moving up the Potomac River and still threatening the nation's capital and Alexandria. The, the United States Treasury at this point, we're two years in, in, into the War of 1812, is, is broke. We don't have money to pay for this war. Congress hasn't approved money to pay for it. Uh, you have parts of New England that are talking about secession. Um, it's, it's really hard to imagine uh, a more decrepit moment in American history. Um, and yet, within the span of a few weeks uh, that I talk about in this book, uh, the United States, through uh, quite a bit of luck, but also a lot of courage and, and just the right things being done at, uh, at the right moment by the right people, is able to turn the situation around. Uh, and we emerge uh, with a, a victory at Baltimore, uh, together with um, uh, another victory further north in Plattsburgh, New York, that completely changes uh, the direction that the war is going on and allows the United States to escape this uh, largely disastrous war on terms much greater, much better uh, than anyone uh, could have imagined just a few weeks earlier. Uh, and the United States has put on a, a course that really, uh, for the first time, establishes um, their unchallenged sovereignty uh, over uh, much of North America. Cool. The I read the book here of the last few weeks, and it, if you all remember the book from the 1980s, The Hunt for Red October, do you remember that? That's how this book read. I mean, it was one of those, gee, I'm going to stay up late every night, and I'll, I'll read one more chapter, I'll read one more section. It, it, it goes very, very vibrantly in these shorter sections, and you spend almost equal, as if you're a camera, spending almost an equal time with the American side as with the British side. It's a really cool style that you wrote this in, and how did you come about writing this style? You know, a part of it is having worked as a journalist, um, you know, sometimes uh, what, what the editors tell you is, we want a TikTok. And what I was trying to do is, you know, er everybody's heard about the burning of Washington and, you know, the battle for Fort McHenry, but, you know, very few people could put the whole story together and, and tell you how, you know, the, the, the chain of events that uh, led to this moment. It really hadn't been done as a narrative history. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was really gather every document, every interview every every uh, ship's log, you know, every um, letter that had dates and times, and, and by that uh, put together a, you know, very chronological day by day, hour by hour, and sometimes minute by minute account, uh, you know, using techniques that, that James Swanson has used uh, very effectively uh, in his stories about the Lincoln assassination, for example. But it, it's an attempt to really uh, put the reader at the scene and 
knowing really only what is known at that point um, by the, the, the characters that you're writing about. Mm -hmm. Now, we all, I think, approach the War of 1812 as sort of this mysterious war. We're not right, really certain what the war is about, right? Uh, but I think we all have a lot of myths about the war in our head. And myths sometimes are true and sometimes they're not. What were some of the great myths or legends you had to c confront in your research about the book? Yeah, sure. You know, in some ways it's not even a, as much of a myth now, but there's a, a misperception, I think, in the United States um, that uh, people tend to have forgotten that we uh, were the ones who declared war on Great Britain. You know, sometimes people assume, well, Great Britain was trying to take back the colonies. That's what this was about, right? And in fact, it was the United States that declared war on Great Britain. Uh, this conflict has to be seen in the context of uh, this amazing uh, struggle that had been going on in Europe for 20 years between England and France. Uh, and uh, for the last uh, decade with Napoleon on the scene, it, it had, the British had come to see that this fight is a s struggle for civilization. And um, in, that, in that line, much as the United States post 9-11 had a you're either with us or against us attitude, Great Britain had that attitude and they didn't hesitate to trample on American sovereignty to further their ends and that included stopping our ships at sea to, to take sailors to put to work on Royal Navy ships or blocking our, our trade with Europe and uh, President Madison had come to believe that though the United States had won its freedom a generation earlier in the revolution it hadn't truly won its independence and he decided that we might as well remain a vassal state if, if this current state of affairs were to continue so that's an important fundamental understanding that we need to have about this uh, this war. There is, I guess, the so to speak, the low point of the book is where the British occupy Washington, D.C. after the Battle of Bladensburg and then proceed to start torching the different buildings. Uh, there is this myth, which you both addressed in the book and also an op-ed last year in the Washington Post, about we have this myth in our head that it's a, retalia a retaliatory raid. Um, what did you really discover about this. Yeah, I mean, that, that is basically a, uh, that was a PR campaign <laughs> waged by the British after the fact. You know, uh, we have to go back to the beginnings of this story um, and the arrival of uh, uh, a man who really changed this in, the entire nature of the war here in the Chesapeake, uh, Admiral George Coburn, British, very effective um, uh, Royal Navy Squadron uh, commander who decided that he was going to bring the war to the American people. You know, much the same way that William Tecumseh Sherman would uh, uh, 50 years later in the Civil War. And he launched a campaign of torching towns and uh, raiding plantations in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and this, this, a lot of these actions had taken place well before anything was going on uh, in York. Um, and so the uh, 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 York in Canada, uh, the, which is today Toronto being burned, this was something that the British only brought up as justification after the fact when other capitals in Europe were saying, hey, Napoleon didn't burn any capitals uh, in Europe. Why were you burning a, a capital in, in North America? Really, what this, uh, the attack on Washington was about was an attempt. Coburn saw an opportunity to put this war to an end. He thought that by attach, uh, attacking the nation's seat and so humiliating the government of James and Madison, uh, so disgracing it, he could perhaps force it to collapse and at the least force the United States uh, to make peace on British terms. And he very nearly succeeded. Huh. Now, why did the British go after Baltimore? They, they attacked D.C. first, right? And then three weeks later, they go after Baltimore. Why Baltimore and what were they going to do to the city? You know, Baltimore, they, they disliked Washington, but they really hated Baltimore. And <laughs> 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 and we, we have to, you know, look back at the, the cities at the time. Washington, at the time uh, of, of the burning of, of the city, was a pretty small, almost a village. It was uh, some 8,000 people that were uh, uh, living in the capital. It was, it was almost like a collection of these fantastic buildings that had newly been uh, completed, like the, the, um, the White House and the U.S. Capitol. But other than that, it was, um, it was mostly little uh, hovels, a few mansions here and there. Um, uh, it was more woods and, and uh, fields than, than a real city. Baltimore, on the other hand, was this city of 40,000 people, um, third largest in the U.S., 
and it was the re a real center of support for the war 